How you doing everybody? I'm Will Abbott. Um, for the lecture today, uh, the framework that I want to step everybody through today focuses on the language of leadership, particularly looking at uh, some of the key enablers that Denning discusses in chapter two of the secret language of leadership. <clears throat> How I'm going to structure this brief today is we're going to look at the key enablers as they transition through separate time horizons. And how I'm going to transition this to practical use is I'm going to make reference to my time as a battery commander. Um, so to set the context for those unaware of what a battery commander is within the military, you're essentially <clears throat> um, responsible for the health and welfare of the soldier, the non-commissioned officer, the warrant officer, and subordinate officers within uh, the organization. So to expand upon that, I always tell people that you're responsible for the use of time, money, and people within the organization. <clears throat> so the key enablers that I want to focus on uh, for this class as we transition through time horizons is going to be <clears throat> what Denning discusses in chapter two for articulating a clear and inspiring goal. And then we'll look at the importance of committing to that goal as you transition uh, within that organization. And then we'll touch upon the importance of mastering the audience's story. And then I'll close by discussing uh, the importance of telling truthful stories and um, the body language of leadership and how that's important based on the views of subordinates to you. And ultimately, the point that I want to drive home through this lecture looks at um, the importance that key enablers play in organizations as they transition through time horizon. So I'll begin with chapter two of Denning's book, looking at articulating a clear and inspiring goal. One of my first challenges was that I was coming into an organization that had already been deployed together for six months. So obviously they had their established set of relationships. They definitely had a set of routines that was difficult to break in the beginning, but as the months transitioned, it became easier and easier to break those routines uh, gear, and gear them more towards kind of a team-centric organization. Um, so I'll, knowing that, I, <clears throat> I was the new guy in charge to lead that organization, so the pressure you know, up front to make a good impression was extremely high. So now that I had an understanding of the organization in that aspect, I needed to ensure that I articulated a clear and inspiring goal, which Denning discusses in chapter two. So one of the challenges that Denning illuminates uh, regarding the articulation of the clear and inspiring goal is that it needs to be sustainable and it can't be for personal gain. So understanding that, um, I focused my vision on two things. One was a ready team, and the second was a cohesive team, mainly because I viewed those two aspects as a worthwhile purpose that individuals within the organization could really get behind. You know, there was no personal benefit for me having those two things as my goal. The benefit was based solely on the organization itself. Um, in the opening portion of the chapter, Denning also provides a little bit of a story, uh, and he provides examples of uh, leadership in Apple in the 1980s and their attempt to use an antiquated system to enable success. However, the company staff at Apple still saw uh, individuals within the organization supporting Steve Jobs, mainly uh, because they felt that his purpose was enduring. And what that did was it had an effect on um, the enthusiasm amongst the staff because the purpose in and of itself um, was extremely compelling. So I did want to read one quote that I thought was an important takeaway of this chapter. Denning states that goals that are articulated as worthwhile in themselves enhance the possibility of sustained enthusiasm. And I think the point that he's trying to drive home there, which is very important, is that these goals need to be mutually beneficial for the entire organization. Uh, if they're beneficial for you know, the subordinates within the organization, 
or the benefit, you know, mainly the leader of that organization, then there's going to be a gap in that clear vision. However, if they're mutually beneficial for the entire organization, then they'll be more compelling in the nature in and of themselves. Um, <clears throat> so to build on that, um, the priorities that I established um, was that I wanted two things, as I previously discussed, a cohesive organization and a ready organization centered mainly around teamwork. Um, but then also it was important that I quantified those um, two things within my organization. And how I did that was <clears throat> through the successful execution of our operations with team members leveraging each other for support. So now that I had that clear vision on how I wanted to uh, guide the organization, the next challenge was staying committed to that goal. So with that, uh, my goal needed to transition through my entire time as a commander, and I needed to stay committed to that goal. And I knew that up front. Uh, so what that meant for me in my situation uh, was finishing the deployment, reintegrating the unit back at home station, and then execution through the training and preparation uh, for our next deployment, which was less than 15 months after our return. And I thought that this chapter was interesting because Denning illuminates that the driving force behind uh, the goal is the leader story. Uh, it's about internalizing your commitment uh, to yourself as well as to the organization holistically. Uh, he goes on to mention that the commitment isn't just meant, uh, I'm sorry, isn't just mental, but more extensively, it's a commitment of your mind, your body, as well as your soul. Uh, and then he goes on to highlight how leadership uh, is not an appointment, it's a choice. Um, and for leaders in the military, um, as well as uh, leaders within other organizations, you know, they can attest to that, that a commitment to being a leader is one that needs to be taken uh, very seriously. Um, so the night before, you know, I specifically took command, uh, I definitely had a lot of speculation. Um, that's where I developed uh, my plan of action in developing my goal and then using that as the framework to stay committed to my goal. And I knew that um, if my subordinates witnessed me take a stat, take a step back from that vision at any point, that they would lose faith in my decision-making ability. And that would cause a cascading effect uh, throughout the remainder of my time as a commander. And then Denning closes his chapter by segueing into uh, the importance of understanding the audience's story and how he does this is by stating that the vision in itself can be problematic if it is not uh, linked to a deeper understanding of the audience's story. Uh, how understanding the audience's story aided me in transitioning time horizons was fast forward six months after the deployment I had to face a whole new set of challenges in that uh, individuals within my organization were now integrating back into a society that they haven't lived in for over a year now. Um, a lot more access to alcohol, access to their vehicles. You know, a lot of them haven't driven a vehicle in over a year, so there's a little bit of a learning curve when you come back. And then I also had some of my subordinate officers who had only had leadership experience while deployed and didn't have that background and garrison experience. So um, sometimes that doesn't necessarily translate um, the best of ways when you have somebody who's new to the team, their first experience of leadership is being um, you know, a platoon leader while deployed. So there was a lot of adjustments that I needed to understand <clears throat> to effectively lead the organization. So this is where uh, mastering the audience's story really comes into play and Denning discusses this agnosium in chapter four. So one of the main points that he brings up is it's not just about understanding the audience on the surface, but what lies below the surface. So some of the things that aren't necessarily observable. So how do you do that? Uh, fortunately, I had you know six months experience with the team already. So I kind of knew some of their habits. 
but uh, you know, I really had to leverage um, support in um, the fact that I had to listen, watch, really explore some of the new habits that I had coming back to home station. I had to grasp not only the world that I was living in, but the world um, that they were living in. So my support system back at my house was significantly different than a single soldier living in the barracks. So I use those engagements um, through conversation uh, to really understand the audience's story. And based off of that, I was able to select um, you know, some new leaders within the organization that helped me understand everybody holistically. And I could really um, get a great picture based off some of the intelligence that was coming in from those individuals within the organization. Um, so as a result, uh, you know, we successfully integrated the uh, organization back to home station and, uh, you know, the next challenge that we had to face was training and preparing for our next deployment, which was less than 15 months away. The final time horizon I had to transition the organization through was the training and preparation phase. With the preponderance of the same individuals remaining in the battery, Leaders were once again charged with preparing the unit for another deployment in a relatively quick turnaround. Uh, so as Denning discusses in chapters 6 and 7, I felt as if this time horizon required me to remain as transparent as possible. And this meant leveraging uh, what Denning discusses in chapter 6 of authentic communication when I knew something I immediately informed my subordinate. So if my battalion commander let me know some information, I immediately uh, let the masses know uh, what that information was. I never tried to skew any data or you know, keep information close hold uh, for any reason. And then I reinforced that through you know, leadership presence, which Denning discusses in chapter seven in you know, talking to the battery face to face, making a note not to pass data through a third party, just making that eye to eye contact uh, with the team daily. So shortly after uh, leaving command, you know, <clears throat> the battery deployed once again and uh, reports, you know, from them, I keep in contact with a lot of them was, everything's been pretty successful so far, so that's good. Um, so that concludes my presentation today. Again, the thing I was really trying to drive was how we can leverage the key enablers that Denning discusses to assist organizations as we through or as we go through separate time horizons. So if there's any questions on anything, please let me know and thank you.